Hi, this is Allison Sheridan of the Nosilicast Podcast, hosted at podfeet.com, a technology geek podcast with an ever so slight Apple bias. Today is Friday, January 5th, 2024, and this is show number 974. You're getting the show a few days early this week because Steve and I are off to CES this weekend to learn about as much cool new tech as we can possibly absorb. You can look forward to both video and audio interviews coming out of the show, thanks to the work Steve will be doing in the coming weeks. We always have a blast at CES, and it's been a full four years since we've been able to go, so we're pretty darn excited. Last August, I told you about an automated pet feeder from a company called Pet Libro. My goal was to have my two cats, Ada Lovelace and Grace Hopper, get regularly scheduled feedings when we're away from home, but not have the near-infinite supply of food from a plain old gravity feeder that we've been using for years. You see, Grace will regulate her own food, but Ada seems to balloon up when we go away even for just a few days with that gravity feeder. While we do have a pet sitter who comes in daily to change their water and remove their waste, controlling Ada's weight had to become a priority. I explained in that review that the Pet Libro automated pet feeder allowed us to now have scheduled feedings of known portion size. Over the last four months or so, we've come to really like the fact that our cats are fed on a schedule even when we are home. The seamless operation made us stop even thinking about feeding the cats, which turned out to be a problem. A few weeks after I wrote the initial review of the PLAF 203 Granary Pet Feeder from Pet Libro, we went on a trip to a cabin in the High Sierra Mountains with our friends Bill and Diane. Before we left, we knew our internet connection on the trip would be dicey, but we didn't realize it would be completely non-existent during the trip. We managed to survive this by hiking, playing cards, and eating. On our last full day, we decided to drive over to the Mammoth Lake ski area to take Diana Bill up the gondola to the top of the mountain so they could see the spectacular 360-degree view of the Sierras. It's a bit more populated there, so when we got into the Mammoth area, we had cellular service. We immediately began ignoring each other like normal people and played on our phones. While we were up in the area, we took the opportunity to take the tram down to Devil's Post Pile. Since I was obviously bored on the bus ride, it occurred to me to bring up the Pet Libro Lite app to check in on the kittens. From the app, I can watch the cats on video, I can talk to them, and look at the logs to check on their feeding status. Imagine my horror when I saw that for more than a day, the log said that the feeder had been out of food. Now, the Pet Libro pet feeder had been doing its job so efficiently and without effort on our part that we entirely forgot about checking the level of the food before we left. We didn't tell our cat sitter to even look at the feeder to see if the red light was on the front, which would have indicated some sort of problem, like a jammed chute or being out of food. On the tram, we only had little dribs and drabs of internets, but I was able to finally squeeze out a quick text message to our cat sitter, and he raced over and fed the poor things. While Ada could stand to miss a meal or two, Grace is fairly svelte, so I felt terrible for her. While we as pet parents clearly fell down on the job, the Pet Libro software fell down on the job as well. I get notifications constantly when the cats, or anyone really, walks in front of the feeder or if sound is detected. I get notifications when they're fed. I can control when I get these notifications and which ones I receive. But I never got a notification when the feeder was completely out of food, even all during the day when we were in Mammoth Lakes. I kind of put this in the you-had-one-job category. It really should have done this. I began what became an extended discussion with a support person at Ped Libro named Orn. It's taken a fair bit of time to get to the bottom of the problem, but Orn stuck with me. And of the two of us, he was actually much better at closing the loop in our conversations. I was the procrastinator in the conversation. Orn and the team behind him gave me all kinds of suggestions, including uninstalling the app on our phones and such. And while it seemed improbable that this would help the situation, in my tests, it did seem to solve the problem. But then it happened again under controlled testing. I was able to leave the the feeder without enough food, and I didn't get a notification, even though the log files clearly knew that it was out of food. I was finally able to articulate to Orn exactly what the problem was in the app. The Pet Libro Lite app that controls the feeder sends out notifications based on what are called bulletins. Bulletins notify you that scheduled tasks are completed. Log files, on the other hand, contain information about the success or, more importantly, failure of the portions of food to be delivered. But log file information is never sent via notification. So I think the bulletins are actually like 
the mechanism successfully turned, but it doesn't know whether there was food or not. That information is over in the log file, which is never sent via a notification. I sent two screenshots to Orn. The first was of the bulletins, and the second was of the log file over the same period. While the bulletin page happily announced that the schedule tasks had been completed, the log file showed that the feeder was out of food. I think the bulletin page, like I said, is just reporting that signal to churn the mechanism, nothing about whether the food was actually dispensed. I was quite strong in my opinion to Orn that the notification system simply had to be improved. Orn explained to me that the software I was using, as I've mentioned, Pet Libro Lite, was written by a third party, and that Pet Libro had very little ability to modify it for customers with, and I'm quoting here, specialized needs, such as myself. Personally, I think getting a notification when your pets aren't fed is kind of a mainstream need, not a specialized need, but I didn't quibble with him because I liked his solution to my problem. Way back when I got the original feeder, I explained to you that one of the weird things about it was I had to look up the serial number, which is annoyingly underneath and inside the battery compartment, in order to know whether to download the full Pet Libro app or the Pet Libro Lite app. My serial number required the Lite version. At the time, though, I didn't know the difference between the two apps. It turns out that the non-Lite version of the Pet Libro app is one that Pet Libro does control, and Orn suggested it would better meet my needs. Now, Orn's solution included sending me a new PLAF 203 granary feeder exactly like the one I had, but from the new serial number range, allowing me to use the new and improved software. Orn sent me the new feeder back in the middle of December, but I only had the time to set it up now that the holidays are behind us. Spoiler, this new software rocks. It's very similar in layout to the light software, but it's so much better. Since the hardware is identical to the original one, I'm not going to go through how to physically put the feeder together, but I do want to tell you about the installation from a software perspective. I attached the double bowls to the bottom of the canister for the food, and I plugged in the USB-C adapter that has a really nice braided USB-C cable on it. I may actually steal that cable and use it for something else and put a plain one there. Anyway, I downloaded and launched the full-size Pet Libro app, and I plugged in the hardware. The app asked if I wanted to add a new device. Why, yes, thank you, I believe I do. It immediately found the new feeder connected to my Wi-Fi, and guess what it did next? You didn't hear me say I'd put food in the canister, did you? So as soon as it was connected, I got a notification that it was out of food. Happy days are here again. Now I have confidence that this is the device I need. I like so many things better in the new app than the light version. In the light app, we had to tell the feeder how many portions to feed the cat. And nope, they don't tell you how big a portion is. We had to push the manual feed button, pour it into a cup, and then compare that to what we'd been giving them before. The big girl version of the app lets you define it in twelfths of a cup, or you can use units of ounces, grams, or even milliliters. I'm not sure why they use one twelfth of a cup, but it's pretty easy math to figure out that a quarter of a cup is three twelfths and a third of a cup is four twelfths, so I'm not complaining. Both feeders let you create a recording that can play multiple times when it's feeding time, and as a joke, I made mine a pig call, and it goes like this, suee, pig, 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 pig. I have to tell you, this makes Steve laugh every single time the cats get fed. It is worth it for that, but it does make them come running. Now, I like it even better in the new version of the app. You can name the scheduled feedings, so it's easy to name them, say, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The new app let me name the feeder, and I knew immediately what I wanted to name it. I simply had to name the new feeder Pig Slop. Now, that makes us laugh, too, when we open the app. Now, speaking of feeding time messages, you can create multiple recordings where the light app only allowed one. On the scheduling page, you can even control whether the meal call is played on a meal-by-meal -meal basis. Maybe you have a feeding schedule during your nap time and you don't want to be disturbed, so you could disable the pig call during that feeding. You can also change how many times it plays by meal. At this point, Steve and I were pretty excited about the improvements. He downloaded the full Pet Libro app to his phone and logged in with my account just as he'd done with the Light app. To my annoyance, I saw that the app on my phone logged me out. I logged back in and it bumped him off. Well, I was afraid for a minute that was going to be a non-starter because we both need to be able to manage the feeder. I started po poking around in the settings and found a lot more cool stuff, including the ability to share my feeder. 
He created his own account, which is much better anyway, and he was able to log in, and we can both manage the little piggies now. I mentioned that the Pet Libro feeders plug into power via a USB-C charger. But what happens to the little darlings if you have a power outage? Pet Libro anticipated this problem. You can insert three C-cell batteries into the base of the unit for just such an emergency. With the original feeder, we tested the batteries by unplugging the feeder from power. And not only did the feeder entirely stop working, the darn thing lost all of our scheduled feedings. I worked with Orn on that ages ago, and their engineering department was convinced my Wi-Fi signal was too weak, even though the feeder is 10 feet and kind of a line of sight to an Eero mesh router. If there's a power outage, it would seem that the feeder would need to have the schedule stored locally, not dependent on Wi-Fi at all. I argued a bit with Orn and his engineers without success. I didn't keep fussing around with the batteries again, though, because we have a whole home battery backup anyway, but it concerned me for others considering this pet feeder. With this new unit, I put in the same three C-cell batteries and plugged, unplugged the feeder from the wall. I immediately got a notification on my phone that it had lost power. Then I got one that said it would soon be disconnected from Wi-Fi to save power. The Wi-Fi light on the front of the unit turned off and so did the lock light. Normally you have to press and hold on the lock in order to use the manual feed button. That's so your more intelligent pets can't press the feed me button on the front. With the wall power removed, the unit unlocked itself and I was able to use the manual feed button to kick out a portion of food. You know Ada came running and ate it right away, right? But the real test was to find out what happens when the feeding time comes and you're on battery backup. Without wall power, will the new unit know about the scheduled feedings in its firmware and will it execute the feedings on time? With the power still removed, I sat and waited to see what would happen when their dinner time feeding came and the Pet Libro feeder fed them exactly on time as you would hope. While it successfully dispensed the food, it did not make the pig call to alert the cats. This gave the svelte cat, Grace, time to beat the more Rubenesque cat, Ada, to the food and get a bit bigger share than usual. Back on the subject of notifications, you get way more granular control with the full app. You can set custom notification times, you can be reminded of a defined number of minutes before the feeding schedule starts. By default, you're notified when the food level drops below 10%. If you rely on the batteries, you can be notified when they're getting low. Motion detection has more options. Unlike the Light app, you can even set the area for motion detection. You definitely get a notification when the device is offline and one when the food outlet is jammed. There's also so many more options on the device camera itself. You can have it on all day or custom time. You can change the resolution from 1080p to 720p. You can decide whether you want to use night vision. You can save video to the SD slash TF card continuously all day or at a custom time or just let it record when it senses motion. I am having a little bit of trouble getting it to recognize my SD card, but uh, Orn's working with me on that. You can even tell it to record during feeding time. That might be good for us to be able to see whether Grace is ever getting any food at all or if Ada is eating all of it every time. The bottom line is that while I thought the original Pet Libro automated pet feeder was good, the new version of the software makes me so much more confident that if something goes wrong, I'll get a notification so I can do something about it. If you'd like to get the Pet Libro automated pet feeder, Orn assures me that if you buy through Amazon now, you will get the new version of the software and the new serial number of the hardware. The Dual Pet Granary Feeder is $150, and there's a 5% off coupon right now at Amazon. If you buy it directly from Pet Libro, there's a 12% off coupon bringing it down to $132. I haven't checked the shipping, though. Check out all of the Pet Libro products at PetLibro.com. And don't tell Steve, but I've got my eye on the Pet Water Fountain next. It's that lovely time of the year when we make resolutions to do things better. Maybe we resolve to eat fewer carbs. Maybe we promise to be nicer to people. Maybe we set a goal to read a certain number of books this year. Perhaps I can suggest a New Year's resolution that's easy to keep. You could resolve to help a certain tech podcaster fund the shows you like so much. If you just go to podfeet.com slash Patreon, you can enter any dollar or euro or currency of your choice that you prefer to support the work we do here at the Podfeet Podcast. I thank you in advance for making this year's resolution a reality. Hi. My name is Allison, and I'm not very smart. Over Christmas, all of our kids and grandkids came to visit. It was positively glorious. Kyle and Nikki and their three little darlings flew in early to spend a full week with us. 
They came early to miss the flight rush, and so they had to work for a couple of days on and off while we took care of the little ones. Then Lindsay and Nolan and their two angels came up on Christmas morning. You can imagine the chaos that was our house with six adults and five children from ages seven down to six months. Just the luggage and clothes and toys were crazy. And then add in all of the Christmas presents, and it was just nuts at our house. Now, when Steve and I visit our kids, we always forget something. There's only two of us. But both of our kids and their spouses are amazing at sweeping through each room and gathering up what's theirs, even when there are multiple families at the house. But this year, the level of anarchy was just a bit too high, and quite a few things got left behind. Most of the things left behind were things like ah, parts to toys or a random sock, but one really important thing was left behind. We have a charging station in the kitchen, and after everyone had left, I found the charger for Kyle's Dell work laptop sitting on the counter. This was the worst possible thing to be left behind, because Kyle was leaving Texas on an extended business trip on Tuesday, the day after New Year's. I found the charger on the Friday before. I packed up the charger in the smallest box I could find, and I raced over to the local shipping store that does FedEx and UPS. I said that I had to get the box overnight shipped to Texas. The guy said, ooh, that's going to be expensive. I explained that I had no choice because he simply had to have it before he left on his trip. I said I'd pay whatever it cost. Tell me, what do you think it costs to overnight ship a one-pound, eight-by-two-by-four-inch box from Los Angeles to Texas on a Friday? Whatever you think, you guessed too low. It was $170. I about fell over when he told me the price. I said, well, okay, it doesn't have to be Saturday delivery. How about Sunday, two-day shipping? He said Sunday would be the same price. Then I realized, wait, wait, he's not leaving till Tuesday. So I asked, how about Monday delivery? <laughs> Lady, that's a holiday. They don't even deliver on Monday. I was stuck. I couldn't figure out what to do. The worst part was I couldn't ask Kyle what I should do because his flight was still in the air back to Texas. So I paid the $170. When Kyle got back home, I texted him the cost and said, boy, I sure hope you could expense this to your company. He was floored at the cost as well, and he said, I can't expense it. You can imagine how thrilled he was about this. Now, you might be wondering why I didn't offer to pay, but hey, I wasn't the one who forgot it, right? As we texted about it, he said that he could have overnighted a new charger via Amazon for a lot less money. And that's when I realized something that perhaps you've realized already and would have known when you were standing there. When I saw that Dell logo on the giant black power supply in the middle of two power cable pieces, I assumed this was one of those proprietary laptop chargers from back when I was working. I'm certain the rest of you have guessed by now, it was a normal old USB-C charger. I couldn't believe it. What a terrible mistake of judgment I'd made. He probably could have bought a replacement at a grocery store. Even the official charger for Dell from Amazon, I looked it up, it's only $26. I felt so bad when I realized this that I told him I'd at least split the cost with him. Fast forward a few days later, and I was talking to Kyle on the phone, and he said the strangest thing. He said, we confirmed that Nikki's laptop charged just fine using her dock. I wondered why he was telling me that. And that's when I realized the only way this story could get even worse. It wasn't Kyle's charger. It was Nikki's. It never had to be overnighted in the first place. I'm Allison, and I'm not very smart. I tell you what, let's hand off the show to two people who are smart. Bart Bouchatz is joined for the first time with Jill from the North Woods to do security bits. I'm not sure how we should intro this because I'm pretending to be Allison or you're pretending to be Allison or anyway, I promised a solo security bits, but I kvetched about how much I don't like them. And the Nasilla castaways are wonderful people. So of course, a Nasilla castaway jumped in and offered to help out. So jumping in as my co-host is Jill from the North Woods. Jill, thank you. You're welcome. It's good to see you. Well, I guess since you're pretend Allison and I'm pretend me, I guess you're the host. Oh, well, that's true. So I got to have a squeaky voice and then say with an ever so slight Apple bias. Yeah. 
What about three but more octaves speak. higher than that? Yeah. Right. Three more <laughs> octaves higher and then a plank. Right. <laughs> there we are. Um, well, I guess uh, I guess we should probably jump in. Um, there was no stories for feedback and follow up, which is very rare for that section to be empty in my show notes. But I've just noticed I have an empty bullet point floating in midair. So I guess that didn't happen. But we <laughs> do have ourselves quite the little deep dive uh, since last we spoke. So I guess we, we should always start with the TLDR, you know, don't panic. None of the Nacilla castaways are likely to suffer from this in any way, shape, size or form. But it is nonetheless a very major piece of news. So I am talking about Operation Triangulation, which uh, oh. my one paragraph summary is Kaspersky Labs have discovered that they and Russian government officials were targeted by very advanced iOS malware that completely took over iOS devices for the last four years. Apple have patched all the exploited vulnerabilities and regular users were not targeted. Kaspersky say there is not enough evidence to link the exploit to any particular group or government. So yeah, four years. (laughs) Four years. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And these actors are getting so huge, but this is going after big key figures, not us little people, right? (laughs) Right. I mean, I, I... The best write-up I've read by a million miles is Dan Gooden on Ars Technica. And that doesn't surprise me because Dan is one of the best uh, cybersecurity writers for a general audience out there. And I, I've linked to his full article in the show notes if you want the detail blow by blow. But I, I sort of picked out some bullet points to, to summarize the whole story quickly. Um, so the first thing is they went undetected for four years, which gets to the point that it took so much effort to develop these things that you use them sparingly because if you're caught, the jig is up, right. as it now is. Because, right. of course, Apple responded, patchy, patchy, patch, patch. So it's already patched, or is it um, soon to be patched? It is already patched um, because, I guess, well, because Persky have just told us w- the details but the patches have been in a while, so I guess it took them a while to figure out the details. So the good news is if your iOS devices are up to date, you're golden, which is important. And the other good news, of course, is that we the Kaspersky estimate between 100 and maybe up to a few thousand people were targeted. That's not us. That's, no. <laughs> that's just not us. Yeah. Um, the attacks were delivered via an iMessage and... It was the holy grail of iOS attacks in that it was a zero-click exploit. So the way it would work is your phone would be lying there without you noticing it would receive an iMessage and without you doing absolutely anything whatsoever, that iMessage would hack your phone. And it took them... Yeah, it took a chain of four vulnerabilities to do that. Uh, And they're not simple vulnerabilities. And even after all of that, because of the level of security on iOS devices, a reboot would remove the malware. But uh, the attackers had a workaround for that. They just sent more iMessages. <laughs> wow, that's something. Yeah. It is. So to get to sort of the to, to put a picture on how complicated this is, the thing starts with a bug they found in TrueType, which is a font handling library, and. I think one of the lessons from security bits from the last decade is that parsing stuff is hard. We, uh, you probably remember when PDF bugs were the the thing we talked about every single week. Well, a very close relative of that is TrueType, which is a font rendering library. And so they found a bug in the font rendering code, and then they used that bug to exploit another bug in the kernel. And then they used that bug to exploit another bug that gets them into an undocumented hardware feature. And then after that, they still needed one more bug to actually run uh, their arbitrary scripts on the device, which was a bug in Safari, a JavaScript bug they were able to find. So they had to find four zero days. Yeah. So if you think about how much work that must have been, like I, I think that's a billion dollar bug. Like I, I think that is stupendous resources have gone into this, which again is why it's not aimed at us, us regular folk. When you're talking about state, you know, in attacking state actors, you know, on the Russian side or any side, of course, then it's going to be the big powerhouses behind it. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be someone with really deep pockets. And it, I don't think it's cyber crime, which also has deep pockets. So some of these cyber criminal groups are getting to be as big as countries. But given who they went after, 
I don't think we're looking at criminals this time. I think we are looking at, you know, one or more nation states. I guess you could say maybe the five eyes got together and pooled their resources or something like that. Maybe. But again, pure speculation. Right. The really interesting one is this hardware feature, because iOS security has been advancing and advancing and advancing. And one of the things Apple have done in more recently is they've added hardware protections to stop arbitrary code, or arbitrary menu, or sorry, memory writing, even when there's a bug in the kernel. So the hardware is stepping in to stop even an exploited kernel from writing to random pieces of memory. And the kernel is the most privileged part of the operating system. So that is like a stupendous feature to have hardware protections from a kernel bug. Like, that's such a big bar to cross for an attacker. But they found a set of undocumented registers which can be used to write to arbitrary memory if you know what to do. And knowing what to do involves generating checksums and all sorts of things. It's not straightforward to figure out what to do. Which is why Kaspersky were a bit perplexed. Um, And the best they can come up with is, our guess is that this unknown hardware feature was most likely intended to be used for debugging or testing purposes by Apple engineers or the factory, or that it was included by mistake. And I will just throw in, and the other obvious elephant in the room here is some sort of supply chain attack. Because Apple designers will have built the spec for the chips they wanted manufactured. And they would have sent that to a manufacturer. And if at some point in between someone added in a few extra bits and bobs, then out comes something like this. That makes sense. Yeah. So as you said, definitely fully patched. Right. Well, one of the things I always think of, too, is always talks about you never have to reboot Apple things. They'll go on and on forever without (laughs) reading reboot. But maybe because of my Windows experience, I reboot all the time, at least once a day, because I know that if anything is attacking your computer, it clears it out. (laughs) Yeah. And the reason I I guess we should say, because I I think we've mentioned a few times on Security Bits that iOS is very, I don't remember the last time we had an issue that was persistent in iOS. And the reason for that is secure boot. Because each time your phone boots up, there's cryptographic checks of the operating system being loaded into memory. And so if an attacker succeeds in write, in rewriting the flash memory on your phone, then the phone will fail to boot. So wow. the choice they have is their, their exploit goes away on a reboot, or the phone doesn't reboot, in which case their exploit has gone away by default. So the best they can do is reinfect. And a secure boot is the key to that, cool. which is why jailbreaking is hard and why right. Apple locked jailbreaking down so heavily. And that, that's why there are no jailbreaks on modern iOSs that we know of. Right. Uh, I already mentioned this is fully patched. And obviously, the other thing here is that this is very, very advanced. We don't really know who did it. And I think there's a lot of conspiracy theorizing out there, but I just want to share what Kaspersky have concluded they were the people targeted, the people with the skills to check this out, and they say the following. Currently, we cannot conclusively attribute this cyber attack to any known threat actor. The unique characteristics observed in Operation Triangulation don't align with patterns of known campaigns, making attribution challenging at this stage. So they don't know, and they're the best place to know. So if you hear people speculating, that's what they're doing speculating. But again, just remember, none of us are important enough to be worth being targeted by something like this, which I take great pleasure in. I am completely not interesting. Yay. Yeah, that's right. Well, and the good thing about it is, I mean, I do work in healthcare. I'm not interesting, but I have access to things that are interesting. And so, you know, you feel glad when they fix them. But eventually these things trickle down, unreined in. They eventually get to us. And so it's good they fixed it. That's it exactly, right? Because once the, once the, the secret is out, then you know the cyber criminal people are putting their resources into reverse engineering whatever information they can get from the patch. That's one of the big ironies, actually. One of the big ways cyber criminals get in is when Apple or Microsoft patch their operating system, the cyber criminals reverse the patch to try to find what's changed. And then based on what's changed, they can probably figure out the vulnerability. And so if there is a patch, and you don't have it, your exposure has just jumped through the roof. Right. Which is why I always say, stay patched so you stay secure. Which I repeat to myself all the time. 
I just sit there and say that every time I patch. So Yay! <laughs> I have a catchphrase. It's not very exciting, but it is a catchphrase. <laughs> Unless you have anything else to add, Jill, I think that sort of covers off that rather large piece of news. It's great. So jumping on then to action alerts, just two little bits of patchy, patchy, patch, patch. Um, Google Chrome fixed their eighth zero day of 2023, and it is now 2024. So I guess eight is the total for the year. So patchy, patchy, patch, patch, which for Chrome users means doing that thing you hate doing and turning your browser off and turning it on again. Because it will auto-update, but you do have to restart it for the update to take effect. And I don't know about you, but I'm Mr. 20 million tabs person. Oh, I try not to. But like I said, that might be a leftover from my Windows life. <laughs> so <laughs> I keep them trimmed down. Well, I guess if you reboot every day, by default, you're forced not to do what I do, which is everything I must remember is a tab. And it's not just tabs in one window. It's actually, I'm dead curious. I haven't prepped this at all. How, if I go to Safari and click on show me windows, how big is the list? This should be fun window. OK, so my tabs are spread over 15 windows. None of those windows have one tab. None of them have one tab. I can promise you that. So, yeah, I, I am guilty as charged here, but I am a Safari user at least. So not a not a Chrome user, because unfortunately, having once been the lean, mean browser, Chrome is not so lean these days. No, oh, I always related it as a two-year-old tripping over its own shoelaces, that it tried to be fast, but sometimes it was faster than it could be and it would just fail. So when you work in enterprise software, you beg people, don't use Chrome. It's not, you know, going to render your page the way you might expect it to. Yeah, I'm very happy that Microsoft Edge is now a remaking, of uh, basically Chromium without Google's cruft. And it is yeah. now a snappy browser without too much faffing about, which is pleasing. Yeah. Uh, our second action alert is Apple have released macOS Sonoma 14.2.1, which has one security fix. So if that is you, patchy, patchy, patch, patch. There were a lot of other updates from Apple, but they are, um, they're not security, they're just bug fixes. So, you know, you probably do want to patchy, patchy, patch, patch, because... Well, it's nice not to have bugs all over the place, but it's not mission critical. Great. Worthy warnings then. Um, I regularly tell people not to pirate software. A, because I think it's evil. Like, as someone who writes software, it's, how dare you steal that from people? But B, it's really, really dangerous. So we have proved that fact uh, by a new story that broke the week before last. Um... People who were pirating games like Grand Theft Auto, Assassin's Creed, or The Sims 4 accidentally ended up with some bonus extras in their, um, in their download. Fake VPN extensions force installed into Chrome, and it happened 1.5 million times based on the download numbers. Wow. Yeah, wow. so... A lot of software piracy out there, and that's not good. So yeah, don't steal software. No, I mean, I agree with you. I tell, I tried to tell people it's like walking into a store and grabbing a CT and stuffing it in your shirt. It's that bad. And no one would believe me until they kind of became software developers themselves. And then they understood. But yes, one, it is stealing. But two, that was around in the 80s, too, when people would steal games and it would just be loaded full of viruses. And that was back before virus protection. So <laughs> didn't have a lot of and it's been that way forever. I learned that yeah. the hard way when I discovered what a boot sector virus was, having reinstalled Windows 3.1 four times before I discovered what a boot sector virus was. So, yeah. yeah. I haven't stolen well. software since. But yeah, don't steal stuff. Yeah. Just even if, just to protect yourself. <laughs> yeah, I think I was 12 and it was a silly game like Commander Keen 5 or something like that. But, you know. Um, those of us in Europe are probably familiar with an app called Easy Park because it is probably the widest used parking app here in Europe. It is used by many, many, many cities and they had a wee bit of a data breach. Um, I guess the good news is there were no passwords in the breach and there were also no full payment details so they can't steal your money. But unfortunately, what was included was your name, your physical and email address, as well as those sort of no, the last four digit kind of bits of credit debit card numbers and IBANs, which are your banking details these days. 
Is IBAN European or global? I can never remember which is us and which is everyone. Do you guys have IBANs? I don't think I recall that term being used around here like that. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure what it is. So why don't you tell us well, what it is? It is It is a, I think the I is for international, so you probably have them under the hood. But basically, instead of having a sort code and an account number, your IBAN is like your all-in-one, this is how you get money to me. And so European um, banks have really moved towards IBANs for everything because in the European Union, there's a lot of inter-country trading. Mm. You know, interstate is kind of easier than inter-country. And I think that's why we ha- we're so big on our IBANs. But I think if you wanted to send money to Europe, you'd need to find your IBAN. Sorry, if you need, wanted to receive money from us Europeans, I think you have one, but you wouldn't know it. Whereas we use them all the time. And therefore... Like you're used to maybe seeing the last four digits of your social or the last four digits of a credit card, the last four digits of your IBAN is a thing here. And so the attackers have those partial credit debit or IBAN numbers, which means they can make extremely convincing and automated targeted phishing. Because they know who you are, where you are, that you park, and they know enough to pretend to know your full payment details. That could be very convincing. So we have applications here like Venmo and and transfer money systems that way. Do you think it's less safe to have a unified IBAN system or less safe because we're private organizations? Uh, well, we have those as well. So I, I don't think they kind of move. I don't think they really meet each other. They solve different problems. So you generally be using your IBAN or something for uh, direct debit or, uh, you know, corporations would use them a lot for paying invoices and stuff. But you wouldn't, they wouldn't replace a Venmo where you'd quickly throw someone a bit of money or whatever. Um, Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. So I imagine the IBANs are there actually because Easy Park is big enough that if you owned a fleet of corporate vehicles, you would have some sort, you know, probably a very large monthly uh, contribution going over to Easy Park for your fleet. It's probably why those IBANs are there. Um, gotcha. This is the time of year when lots of people get, you know, new iOS devices from Santa Claus. And so it is not surprising at all that this is a time of year when the good folks at Intego have noticed a rise in iCloud scams. Specifically, iCloud free storage. Click here and hack yourself emails okay. so yeah don't do that you manage your iCloud from the iCloud setting inside system preferences whether it be on iOS or Mac OS or from Apple's actual website you do not manage your iCloud from an email because it's probably not from Apple and they're also not big on giving away free stuff Tim Cook is convinced that services are the future for Apple so he's not giving what? away a lot of that I know who knew <laughs> Who knew? But that's a great point because I get emails constantly from my web host provider. Oh, I could get free extra storage. I could get free this and, and iCloud. I get those too. And don't I don't click on any link I get from any email. I go to that website. Chase wants to talk to me. I log into Chase. You know, <laughs> I don't. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I'm guessing Chase and, and banks are probably like our ones here. So when I log into my bank, I have a little bell icon in the top corner and any advertisements they want to throw my way are sitting right behind that little bell button where they will tell right. me all about the cheap loans I don't want, but they want me to want, yada, yada, yada. Right. Right. Notable news then. It was Christmas, so I guess I shouldn't be surprised this section is a little on the sparse side. A whopping two notable news stories. And one of them is one of those ones that I changed my mind on about five times as to whether or not to include it. And if Alison was here, I might get shouted at, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think it's important for people to understand how cybercrime works because it always comes down to follow the money. And initially, ransomware was going after regular folk and saying, give us money or we're going to delete all of your family pictures you value so much. And then they went, ooh, corporations have more money than people. So then they started ransomware in corporations saying, pay us up or you're never getting your data back. And then they realized that it would be really embarrassing to leak data. So then they started doing what's called a double extortion, pay us up or you're not getting it back and we're publishing it. But now there's something called a triple extortion where they go one step further and when the company doesn't pay, they go straight after the victims and 
individually extort each of the victims in the data they stole that they were going to hold the company to ransom for. So I am sorry to say, if you live in Oklahoma, that your largest not-for-profit health public health care network has been compromised. It's called Integris Health. They run lots of hospitals and clinics and things. And the attackers have given up on getting the money from Integris because they quite rightly are not giving in to this kind of extortion. And the FBI and everyone tells you, you do not pay. Uh, so now they've started to send ransom emails directly to the victims, i.e. the patients of these not-for-profit healthcare facilities. So charming, charming individuals. That, that did happen to me. Uh, my company that I used to work for got hacked. They downloaded our HR database with social security information about the uh, workers. And then they reached out to, when the company wouldn't pay, they reached out to us and said, make private deals oh, with us. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, so there you go. And it's, you know, it's all about the money. So follow the money. And it, it was inevitable that they would decide that that is a way to go and and extract money but yeah the, the advice is still the same don't pay because you have zero guarantee paying them will achieve anything and there is a possibility that in paying them you're literally breaking the law because they if they are a russian entity you could be in breach of sanctions yeah um they did pay uh after our information was up on the internet for 24 hours which is forever on the internet so yeah <laughs> it was the worst of all worlds <laughs> That doesn't seem like it achieved anything other than draining the bank balance because, well, like, there is no undo button for the internet. Well, it turned out they had other information that became ah. mm, juicier for other people to want to prevent that from getting to the internet. So we were okay. The other information was a little less, uh, less, uh, yeah, they didn't want that gone. Right. Yeah. Then that is another technique. Of course, you leak a little bit and then you threaten to leak more. And then you hint at how juicy the more might happen to be. Ask yeah. Sony Pictures how that feels. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, these hackers. But here's the thing is, uh, um, I th think I heard, and you can tell me if this is true or not, that they started going after the bigwigs, the companies, the deep pockets, because we're little people. But then little hackers ended up buying hacks against people. You know, so now these companies migrated up. Yeah, well, there's now a thing called ransomware as a service. So right. if you're a small operator, you can basically buy yeah, ransomware as a service. Like you would buy Dropbox, which is storage as a service, you can buy ransomware as a service. And the people doing the hard work of the hacking take a cut, a bit like an app store, 30% is quite normal. And so you get 70% of the hackery you do, and they get 30% for providing you with the tools. And you really don't need any skills whatsoever. You just need enough operational security not to get arrested tomorrow. But other than that, that you know, it's all you need. You just give away 30% of the profit and that's that. So yeah, it's cybercrime is money, 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 money. And understanding how the money flows is very important. Literally, I, I, do, I literally do an, an hour long... Uh, talk to Mac user groups. And that's the basic theme, follow the money, because that gets you everywhere. So, so yeah, they, these people will get everybody. Just li the little people will get the little people and the big people will get the big people. And then <laughs> the big, big people will go after the big, big people. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes law enforcement have a big success and they shut things down. So it is a cat and mouse game, but the probability is high that someday, sooner or later... You're going to be involved. So backup, backup, backup is definitely your friend. Yeah. And switching from cell phone authentication to two-factor authentication through an app. That's how we got caught with cell phone authentication. And um, yeah. yeah, so as much as you pass can keys. do to stay secure, passkeys, right? Go to passkeys. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've I've started to use passkeys through one password, and it is such a magical experience that it follows me from operating to operating system to operating system. It's just there, you know. It's, right. I just say to GitHub, here, use my passkey, and one password pops up, scans my fingerprint, and then or my face, depending on where I am. That's brilliant. Anyway, I have a good news story. Thankfully, the other new, the other notable news is way less depressing. Uh, Google okay. Chrome, which is still bloatware, but nonetheless, it is safer bloatware. Um, Google have announced that they are expanding what they call their safety check feature. And one of the things they're doing is having it run automatically in the background all the time. And it will then present any information it finds to you in real time, which is way more useful. So 
Just two little uh, quotes from the Bleeping Computer article. Safety check compares login credentials against those exposed in data leaks. It also checks for weak and easy to guess passwords that expose users to brute force attacks. And so it'll just do that in real time as you're doing your thing. Uh, And then Google are broadening it. uh, So safety check is also going to automatically revoke permissions such as access to the user's location or microphone for any websites you haven't visited for a long time. So if you've granted some random website microphone access and you haven't been there in ages, that access will evaporate. Which is great because permanent permissions are dangerous. Evaporation is good. Is that going to be both on uh, desktops? Is that both on desktops and on mobile devices too? Or is that... The safety checks? From the article, it would appear that this automatically always running in the background thing is a desktop feature, which may have something to do with how these things are architected. Um, It's not to say they won't get something useful to mobile, but there was no mention of it in the article. So I'm going to assume if there was, they would have, you know, bragged about it. Right. Yeah. So we have no top tips this week, but I do have one excellent explainer I thought I would link people to. The good people at Apple Insider have a nice, simple article on how to protect yourself from QR code scams. And I'll give you the quick summary. Remember, a QR code is just a URL. So like any other URL, look in the address bar to see where you have actually landed. It is now a thing where attackers are going on places like, say, public parking in some cities is done with QR code, and they are printing out malicious QR codes and sticking them over the legitimate ones. And then the URL takes you to a website that looks like the city's website, but isn't the city's website, and you see where this is going. So... Always look at where you end up, right? It doesn't really matter how your browser opens. If your browser opens and it's on a page where it's looking for you to tell it something, always glance up at that address bar. Look where you really are, not where you think you are. And the other really good tip is that if you're an iOS user, the safest way to actually scan a QR code is not with some sort of third-party app you downloaded from the App Store, because a lot of those are really quite dodgy, it's actually to use the camera app because the camera app will detect them automatically as you're pointing it around without even taking a picture. Just, you know, turn on the camera and point and it will show you the URL and you then have to click on it before you go anywhere. So it's a it's a nice little double check and I always like to, to use it. In fact, I used it about an hour ago because here in Ireland, when we have to pay import duty on something, our post office very kindly gives us the bill. So we get, instead of getting the package we ordered, we get a little piece of cardboard that says, you owe us blah euro so that you can get your package. Uh, but it has a QR code on it. So instead of having to type in the tracking number like we used to have to do, which is always a pain in the backside, you just scan the QR code. But when using the phone app, I could immediately see it went to onpost.ie forward slash customs. Great. That's where I wanted to go. Tap. Then I safely completed my credit card transaction. Then my bank rejected the transaction because, and I found this out when I rang them up, at this time of the year, there are so many fraudulent customs declarations that we block them all automatically. Or rather, Visa block them all automatically and make people phone in to say it really is them. So that's that's some idea of what Christmas is like, I guess. So anyway. Yeah. I know I was at my um, gas station that used to get those... uh, I don't know, they've been targets of scams before, but it had a big QR code right on the gas station pump. And I thought, I wonder what this is. So I went and did it and like, what are you doing? You don't know what that is. So I put my phone away and put your phone away. Yeah. But as I say, ultimately, they're just links. So as long as you check the URL where you land, you're fine. I mean, they're not magic. They are they're just links in a form the phone can understand instead of the human. That way the phone can go there instead of you, the human, having to type in www. Yada, yada, yada. It was smartly a tiny link. And so ah, oh. you couldn't really tell what it was, you know? And I'm like, oh, no. That makes no sense, actually. Why would you, if you're going to encode a URL in a QR code, why send, oh no, I know why you send it through tiny link, because that way you get statistics. You get tracking oh, okay. statistics. That's what that's about. Plus yeah. it also doesn't say like hacker.com slash. Right. Oh, yeah. The attackers wanted for obfuscation, but a, a semi-legitimate use is to tracking cookies. Right. 
And I use the word semi there because I don't think it's legitimate. If I'm inter- if I'm engaging with a company, you shouldn't be doing that to me. I'm your customer. But, you know, it's not crime. Oh, this was definitely just... fake. Yeah, this was definitely oh. fake. Yeah. Interesting. I, I was I had just read this article yesterday was uh, as I was writing these show notes and I, I was out of my cycle and I noticed that QR codes are now becoming so common that the local secondary school, their welcome board doesn't have the college, the, the school's website. It says, you know, bloody blast community school and a QR code, a giant, big three foot by three foot QR code. Not a web URL, a giant QR code. Oh. So, yeah, they're everywhere. But they are just links. So the idea is don't click on links you don't know and don't click on QR codes you don't know either. (laughs) And I think the most important thing is that when you get to a web page from a QR code, look up, like look up at that address bar. That that is like that advice can never get you wrong because no matter how many redirects you ended up bouncing through at the point in time where there's a text box saying, please tell me things. If you look up at that point in time, that's what matters. And particularly look for the little padlock and make sure that you are at the URL you think you are, because if the padlock says hacker.com, well, then you are securely talking to the bad guys. It's like, yay, right. I can be securely hacked. Oh, wait, no. Right. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I have no palate cleansers because I have never seen my feed reader as empty as it has been in the last couple of weeks because all of my favorite websites let all of their staff have like holidays and things. How dare they? So um, I guess this is as close to a palate cleanser as we get. The iOS camera app is great for QR codes. Use it. I don't know. Well, I did come up with one. Um, Aha, rec- good. Aha. So I've recently uh, been, you know, getting involved in quiet hiking. And I hope I didn't hear this from you, but there's a fellow no. named Herman Hoke, H-O-E-K. He's on YouTube and I can give you the link. And he just hikes places and he doesn't talk. You just hear him crunching leaves, you know, as he walks. Right. And so he's just going on an eight day hike through Yosemite and you just watch it on YouTube. And so when I'm working, I just have this beautiful nature vista in front of me instead of music or a podcast. And it's so relaxing. So I recommend Harmon Hoke, who does these amazing silent hikes. That is a really cool recommendation. It reminds me of a channel I used to be fascinated by as a kid on one of our cable networks. It was a Scandinavian country. They had attached cameras to the nose of their trains. And it was just a TV channel with no sound. Or it might have been some quiet music or something. And it was just the countryside pootling past you with the the difference instead of it being crunching leaves. There was always these two parallel lines in front of you because you were strapped to the front of a train. But you never knew what you were going to get and it didn't change very quick. But it was just a thing to have on. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Jill, thank you very much. Um, And actually, let's do another bonus since, well, yeah, since you're not normally here, why don't we use this as an opportunity to plug your various cool podcasts? Oh, well, thank you. I got started because Allison got me started and I have Start With Small Steps podcast and it's productivity. I try to keep most of my podcasts around 17 minutes, but I'll usually talk about a book you know, someone's famous book, I sort of summarize it and then say whether or not I think this book offers people a lot of good advice and that they should read it too. So it's almost like a book review or I call it a book report, but that's the one that I, um, that's my uh, first podcast. Well, given the time of year when people are thinking of making improvements in their lives, I think that is the most perfect podcast plug there could be because a small step now is the time. And for what it's worth, I am someone who has succeeded over the last decade or so in making some in aggregate substantial changes to my lifestyle for the better. The reason I succeeded was because each step was always small and sustainable. And then when you have one done and it's become a habit, do another one. Let it become habit. Do another one. No, that's absolutely right. And I'm trying to get the whole small steps empire. I have small steps with God, small steps in the Bible, and then I'm going to do a nature one, which is small steps, but it doesn't say small step. But if you're interested in small steps, there's a fantastic book by, oh gosh, now I can't think of his name, but he it's called Tiny Habits. And so if you're looking to sort of expand on your small habits uh, empire of uh, cool. gradually changing your life, the book Tiny Habits is the way to go. 
I'm intrigued by the concept of nature small steps. What will you be teaching people? (laughs) Well, what we're going to talk about is how to see nature outside your front door. There are podcasts out there that will talk about how science works. The blood of a frog keeps him from freezing in winter. But this is really about how to go outside, find nature, see stars, see auroras, what's the weather mean, Mm. and it's just about observational nature. So, okay, you have a subscriber what, straight away because I, I, I spend yeah. a lot of time out walking and stuff and I am always on the lookout for cool and interesting things and stuff to keep an eye out. And one thing the pandemic taught me is that there is fun and interesting stuff on your doorstep because, you know, my world shrank quite a bit, but I still had a lot of interesting stuff going on because I was looking more carefully, more closely. Yeah, well, this one's called Buzz, Blossom and Squeak, and you can use front, uh, small steps if you like. It is not yet live because I'm working on a friend and we're trying to get our groove. You know, it's easy to do a single podcast where you're just doing your own thing, but obviously getting a chemistry together with someone takes a little bit longer. So we're getting there with small cool. steps. Well, <laughs> excellent. What a great call. Look, the very best to look with it. That sounds absolutely fascinating. Thank you. And I'm sure sure you will let us know when it's live and i'm sure allison will be so kind as to plug it for you because i i'll definitely be your subscriber that sounds really cool well and i follow your i follow your social media because you post beautiful pictures of nature so i i love that too and and the thing is it's all within walking distance of my front door because that is that is what i do i go for two walks every day and that's where those photographs come from and so it's i'm always trying to learn more about what's around me and there's a lot there's a lot around you no matter where you live it's just matter where you know. live. Yeah. Cool. Right. I'm supposed to say something. Oh yeah. Remember, folks, until next time, stay patched so you stay secure. Well, how fun was that? I'm starting to feel like I'm working myself out of a job here. Maybe I'm gonna be semi-retired from podcasting. Nah, you can never get the microphone away from me. But anyway, that is gonna wind us up for this week. Did you know you can email me at Allison at podfeed.com anytime you like? If you have a question or suggestion, just send it on over. You can follow me on Mastodon at podfeet at chaos.social. Remember, everything good starts with podfeet.com. If you want to join in the fun of the conversation, you can join our Slack community at podfeet.com slash Slack, where you can talk to me and all of the other lovely Nocilla castaways. Remember, you can support the show at podfeet.com slash Patreon, like Linda Goucher, or with a one-time donation at podfeet.com slash PayPal. If you want to join in the fun of the live show, you're going to have to wait until January 14th. And when you do, head on over to podfeed.com slash live on Sunday night at 5 p.m. Pacific time, enjoying the friendly and enthusiastic Nocilla Castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.